it intended to bring us today to the far side of the Valmont Lake. Uh, we are standing on the levee, but uh, I was hoping to get all the way out to Boulder Creek today. However, there is a Russian olive tree that has fallen in the way of my path. Beyond that, it's shocking how much this levee has changed over the course of the last year since I was out here sometime maybe around August in 2021. For one thing, there are just a super abundance of a yellow flower that has grown up all throughout this area with these delicate little petals growing up a, a rather robust stem. There are purple thistles all over of this vibrant and brilliant color. The snowy white of the leaf for the Russian olive, despite the fact that that above anything else is a, probably the most significant weed that we have growing up around the Valmont Lake. And intermixed with all of these beautiful flowers, I've almost stepped on a snake. I've seen a mouse run by. There have been bumblebees and honeybees. There have been dragonflies. Uh, a cormorant flew overhead. I've seen red-winged blackbirds. This place is alive. It is vibrant, it is active, and it is such a beautiful place to be. And as I have been looking around at the nature about me, I can't help but think about the ways that nature is regularly used to explain the activity of God throughout Scripture. And really, this should come as no surprise. After all, we do have a creator God who has looked at the abundance of this world and has called it good. Everything from the simple yellow flower to, let's see if I can get a root here. All right. These roots going deep down into the earth as well as spreading their tendrils across the surface, just picking up every bit of nutrient that this plant can in order to continue to support life. And not only its own life. One of the most poignant passages about nature in scripture for me is a little parabolic saying from Jesus where he notes that unless a seed falls into the ground and dies, it cannot produce much fruit. That is to say, any of these plants, in order to continue to perpetuate themselves, must continue to, to give up their lives, to die, to produce these flowers that end up bearing seeds, that fall into the ground, that produces this great proliferation of yellow. Now, beyond this, they are not only supporting their own life. Like I said, the bees are flying and finding the pollen and spreading them between plants. Uh, the little mice are running along the ground and are eating up the seeds as they fall to the ground. The snakes come and eat the mice. The Eagles and raptors come and feast upon the snakes. The other insects that are buzzing about are food for the birds, which in turn will feed the coyotes and the bobcats. They will continue this great cycle where then the animals that eat the plants will defecate into the earth, which feeds the plants and the cycle continues. And when I think about the incredible instruction that God has interwoven into the natural world, I can't help but think again of Jesus' parable. Because clearly Jesus is not just giving a botany lesson. It's not only about how 
a seed produces a new plant, but rather it is about the way that the human life needs to be about self-sacrifice, self-giving, in order to eventually produce the kind of human existence that God desires, the kind of kingdom that has already been begun and is growing up all around us, but is still not in its full bloom. We need to see a sacrifice, a self-giving, in order to fully bear witness to what God is desiring to do in the world. Consider Philippians chapter 2, where Jesus is noted as not considering equality with God as something to be grasped, to be exploited, but rather that he empties himself and takes on the form of a servant, dying the death of a slave, in order to lift other people up. I think that the most poignant example of this line of thought ends up taking place in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, where Paul is meditating and wrestling with what exactly is going to be the mysterious resurrected life that we will share with Christ. And as part of this rumination, he ends up discussing a seed where you don't know exactly what kind of plant a seed will produce until it has fallen into the earth and died and then produced the plant that it is meant to be. This seed, this self, this body, this human existence that is Eric is not going to fully reveal what it is meant to become until it finally shares in the true poverty of the human life and enters into death with Jesus, my Lord. And at that point, there will be the opportunity for what has been sown in perishing qualities raised to eternal qualities. I will eventually see the kind of life that I am truly meant to have, to share, to embody, to become. And that is true of all human life. It is not something that can be gripped too firmly because then I will only destroy what this delicate, beautiful thing. It is no longer good for the bee to find pollen. It is no longer good for the mouse to feed upon. It is no longer good for sowing new life into the ground. If I hold on to it tightly, it is ruined. And that is true of the human life as well. If we hold on to this momentary beauty, it is ultimately going to be lost. It is something that we need to hold with open hands and allow for God to do with it what God will. Think about Jesus mentioning in the Sermon on the Mount how the flowers of the field have a greater beauty than anything that Solomon could ever attain to in all of his wealth. But even still, it is here today and gone tomorrow, thrown into the furnace or decomposing in the ground. Well, that's true of all life, not simply the flower. So let your life be something beautiful in the here and now. Because as it shines forth in beauty in the present, it is only a dim shadow of what is to come. It won't fully reveal what you are, what you are to be, until you have fully given yourself over in death to Christ. And so as I stand in this field of flowers, meditating upon God's good creation and what it is instructing us about the life to come, I would encourage for you to live your life with open hands. Live it in a way that does not cling tightly, but rather gives 
freely to God and to others. Because it is only as we begin this practice of self-renunciation, of mortification, of allowing for ourselves to enter into our destined fate, of sharing in the death that Christ had, that we will begin to be opened up into sharing with the life that he is bringing into all of the world. As Paul writes in Romans chapter 8, all of the world is groaning in the present in labor pains to see the first fruits of God's kingdom, of God's new creation. And my friends, we are participating in that work. Not only do we groan with creation to see our God's will accomplished, but God's new creation is being produced in us. But it is produced in the death of our Lord and in his resurrection to new life. May you also share in this new life today and always. May you place your hope in the indestructible life of Jesus our Lord.